So, um, with um, immense gratitude and honor for the invitation, uh, I would like to take the opportunity uh, to share my thoughts uh, on an ongoing debate about short-termism in the marketplace and in corporate America. Now, this is not a seminar, so I don't have to tell you about how we double cluster standard errors or saturate fixed effects. It's a general topic, and I'm not confined uh, to one paper or papers of my own. Uh, instead, I will try to navigate the topic um, by building on collection work, some of which you will see that were probably not created for the purpose um, that I'm referencing. Okay, uh, let's start with posing a question. Have people become increasingly more short-termist? You know, every generation has something to complain about the generation that is younger to them, and short-termism seems to be the current focus of the complaint. Now, if you ask Fabrizio Freda, uh, he will say yes. Mr. Freda is the CEO of Estee Lauder, the global leader of the beauty business. Now, the firm is growing and growing, but Ms. Freda couldn't fail to notice that there seems to be a secular change in the composition of the main product lines of the farm. The makeup business has been growing much faster than all other categories. And in 2017, it actually overtook the crown jewel status of what the company was famous for, its skin product. Now, why is this bad news? For many, many decades, women from the Generation X, for which I am a member, now Esther Lauder led us to believe in our youth, if we religiously apply a skin product on face, that we will look amazing in the long run. <laughs> now, it turned out that women from Generation Y or the Millennials are not so patient to wait for the long-term effect to materialize. <laughs> Instead, they choose to cover up whatever imperfections before posing for selfies. <laughs> now, both products could further be disrupted by Adobe's Photoshop, <laughs> which Generation Z women would use to create completely uncompromised looks on any screen. Why is bad news for the business? Because if you're a business person, you know that it is much easier to charge a price at a premium for home in a job than overcharging living for the day. Now, if the spirit of short-termism were to prevail in the business world, then there will be more serious damage than the skin complexions. In fact, this has been a concern of many political and economic luminaries, out of which I list the two here. Ms. Clinton, the former presidential candidate, famously coined the term quarterly capitalism to describe the sorry state of the management of public companies whose vision and incentives did not get beyond the next quarter report, so she feared. And even if you are not a CEO, you probably don't want to miss out the annual letters to all CEOs from Larry Fink, the leader of the world's largest asset management companies. Now, Mr. Fink can assume the role of the godfather of corporate long-termism as well as social responsibility. If you read his 2015 letter to all CEOs, he warned all the managers, corporate America, against fighting for the short-term financial gains and also asked them not to succumb to the pressure from the activist investors because they're here for immediate returns. Now, a year later, his view changed somewhat. He acknowledged that there's a possibility that some activist investors could actually 
have a more long-term value of focus than the management of the companies that they target. And he indicated that his firm, which is the largest voter uh, in the proxy access, will line up with those short-term investors if they have a more compelling case than the corporate manager. Now, all this raised to the question as who are short-termists? The market, some investors, or the managers? I would say there is prima facie evidence for all three candidates. Now, if you consider the market, it is true that shareholder turnover has been galloping in the last 30 years, the data which I will show. And also, oftentimes, we'll see that the stock price will throw a tantrum if a firm dares to miss its earnings forecast by one penny. So no wonder some argue that public companies are leaving the stock exchanges in halls. Now, we all know about the Wilshire 5000, which is supposed to have 5,000 stocks. But today, it actually has 3,486 because it couldn't get 5,000 publicly traded stocks that are, have reasonable liquidity to include it in stock, uh, stock index. There are also other proposals that perhaps we should change the disclosure frequency from the quarterly to semi-annual so as to give the manager some breathing room from quarter to quarter. Now, if you look at investors, the short-term gains accrue to high-frequency traders and activist investors make them the ready culprits for short-termism. Because if not they, who else could be? They're also event-driven arbitrageurs who seem to exert undue influence in corporate control changes. This is why the proposal of tenure-based voting has been imminently appealing. So under such a proposal, you will give shareholders, long-term shareholders, say those who have held stocks for more than three years, superior voting rights, such as three votes per share. So is the three by three proxy rule, which means if there's a beneficial owner owns more than three percent of the firm for more than three years, they should be granted automatic access for the privilege of board member nominations without a contest. You can also argue perhaps the short termism is really, really ridden with the management because the tenure has been pretty short, much shorter than the savers for pension. Now, 20 years ago, the average managerial tenure was about eight years on average, and today it's closer to seven. And as on that, people also argue that the managerial compensation seems to vest too soon right after their departure, making it impossible to hold them accountable for the errors that they see did during their reign because they will be gone when it is discovered. So the proposal could be longer vesting period or even clawback for, long, for wrongdoing discovered long exposed. Indeed, so if you look at shareholder turnover, that can change dramatically. If you look at uh, in as recent as say in the, uh, in the early 1990s, the average stock changes, changed the hands once every two years. And today, it is more like four times a year. However, this chart did not tell you actually the long-term shareholders' influence and presence have also been increasing. So if you look at the left panel, this is the composition of short-term, intermediate-term, and long-term institutional shareholders uh, institutional uh, asset managers or shareholders, which we cannot distinguish from the 13F database. We classify the short term as portfolio turnover rates to be over 100% and long term to be below 33.3% with an inverse average horizon of over three years. So you can see over the past 10 years, the percentage of long term shareholders actually have been increasing. Now, on the right panel, it shows 
the proportion of asset under management that go to the top five, BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, State Street, and Capital Research. Now, they are the, actually the anchoring weights in the election or voting of any contentious voting events, whether it be a contentious proposal, a contested election, or a control change. So, if you worry about the short-term investors, then we should all be quite relaxed knowing that 30% of these asset management are actually in the hands of investors who all claim to be very long-term, and they are. And lastly, Dell and Michael Dell is a telling case about managerial perception about public market short-termism. In 2013, Michael Dell felt that his company was really, really unappreciated and shortchanged by the public market. That's why he took the public private to seek long-term support from private partners like Silver Lake. Now, barely five years later, Dell is going public again. You can Google on YouTube the interview of CNBC to Michael Dell reading the question about what has changed about his perception about short-termism in the public market barely five years ago. He talked and talked, and in the end, he acknowledged a lot has changed for us in the last five years. Perhaps also his perception about how short-termist the public market could be. Now, let's get down to a little bit of more formal evidence about our market subjects to short-termism. I adopt a very layman definition of what short-termism is, just to connect academic research with what people commonly perceive is problem. So short-termism refers to excessive focus on short-term results at the expense of long-term interests. In a security market, you can imagine it is as if investors are excessively discounting cash flows that will appear in the distant future and are under discounting current or near-term cash flows because they just like near-term gains. Now, such a hypothesis could be tested in several settings, and in fact, our colleagues in asset pricing has been doing so. But before I go to the formal test, Let's form a first impression on how plausible such a hypothesis is. Now, thanks to the very generous data provided by Ken French on his website, we can easily form portfolios based on the dividend yields. We can look back as early as 1950 or as recent as 2001. Regardless which horizon you look at, it seems that stocks with the highest dividend yield has historically yielded the highest return. So if you believe that ex post return has some association with the discount rate, it doesn't seem to be that investors love stocks with near-term gain. Now, a lot of you can immediately accuse of such a test because it's not controlled for risk factors, it makes exempt with exposed, etc. So we can look at better settings. So an ideal setting for this testing it could be dividend strips. Now ever since 2000, the dividend strips are traded separately that allow investors to trade future dividends of a given time horizon directly that is separate from the stock that's stripped of the dividend. So you can think about the stock price is the present value of the near-term dividends as well as the value of the stock. Of course, you can also uncover the present value of the dividend from the call parity, but the derivative trading would give us better numbers. So, I'm quoting a paper, a very ingenious work by Ben Binsberg and Brent and Kojin. They discovered that implied discount rate for near-term dividends is actually higher than for the long-term residual value. Now, in this setting, they are able to adequately control for volatility of the common risk factors. Now, a slightly later paper by Schultz okay, 
show that the term structure of the equity risk premium was not as downward sloping as the previous authors indicate, uh, but actually is more flat. But regardless which conclusion you would take, the market does not seem to value long-term assets less than short-term ones. Now, how about innovations? Managers constantly express the fear that if they devote too much energy resources on innovation that would materialize its benefit in the long run, then the market will fail to appreciate or underprice it. Now, such a hypothesis also seems to be refuted by another piece of ingenious work by Cohen, Ditter, and Malloy. These authors show that highly innovative firms, whether you measure by IMD or by number of patents, are actually quite fairly priced. More interestingly, innovative firms with better past track record are undervalued and worse past track record are overvalued. What does it tell us? It tells us actually not only the markets are not short termers and people fear, it's a bit overly failure tolerant. Always give the firms another chance. In fact, if you are a smart investor, you can capitalize on this overly failure tolerance by form a long shot portfolio that never will give any return as high as 11%. Now come to my favorite topic, hedge fund activism, which Alan Rob and I have been diligently working on for the past 15 years. So this is the headline result that the market seemed to welcome the arrival of hedge fund activists. When we first published paper in 2006 in Journal of Finance, that sample yielded a short-term pop of 7%. And now we update it to 2017, since 1994, it's closer to 5%. Not surprising, because any profitable strategy would see compressed spread um, with maturity. What it showed that whether it's is when the activist shows up, on average, the stock price responds positively by 5%. It is a short-term gain. Okay. However, the short-term gain is not reversed in long run, meaning it is also a long-term gain. So if we form the portfolio-based, sorry, calendar-based portfolios, which we crop out the event month, the month zero is not here. So minus 36 to plus 36 is basically number of month or three year prior to three year after. So if we look at the alpha coefficient, basically these firms were underperforming relative to the four factor model prior to the activist arrival. And once the five pop is done, there's no more positive or negative drift. It's pretty much a random walk for the long run. Hence, there's no clear distinction between the short-term and long-term because the market is efficient that the short-term gain is sustained uh, in the long run. Perhaps the ultimate metric for long-termism should be innovation or IND, which is investing for the long run. Now, this is something that highlighted by Larry Fink in his 2015 letter to the CEOs urging them not to yield to the pressure of the activist investors who are asking for more payouts, more spin-offs, and cost-cutting, because he feared that would lead to underinvesting in innovation. So our question is, do such actions actually weaken the innovation of the companies? In this paper with Roth, Ma, and Tian, we first look at dynamics of I and D in the difference in different setting. Indeed, after the emergence of hedge fund activists, the average target firm's I and D dropped by $15 million. That is quite a significant magnitude. However, once you normalize the I and D by assets, it's essentially flat. So just show you that the activist investors tend to advocate for streamlining and refocusing on the firm, leading to shrinkage of assets and IND shrinkage.
shrinkage is not more than proportional. More importantly, given the limited or more limited inputs, the outputs are actually strengthening. On the left chart, we show the number of patterns by the firm post-targeting and actually show the number of patterns actually increase by about 15%. The right panel shows the citation per patent and it's a similar magnitude of improvement. This is why we think we can debunk some of the myths that arise from equating the short-termism with investor horizon. A corporate manager who would assume that long-term investors would be their natural ally in the fight against activists, they will be disappointed. Because in recent years, the index funds and quasi-index funds are increasingly collaborating with the activists. Take BlackRock. In the past five years, BlackRock voted for the dissident slate of board nominees in over 40% of the time. And as students of finance, and we all know for active management, the investment horizon is determined by the duration of perceived mispricing. Now Warren Buffett looked for mispricing that will last or recover over a 10 year period. Activists look to improve the firm in a two to three year duration, and high frequency traders, they look for returns in the BIPs magnitude and the frequency, the sub-second frequency. This is why the valuation creation does not bear a natural or even any known correlation to the duration of the business initiative. And the dividends pay out, they are not eaten. They remain in the ecosystem and they could be invested in other forms or newer forms of innovations. Now, I was a student from University of Chicago, hence I have an inherent bias to believe that it's very, very difficult in the market to create short-term gains by tanking the long-term perspective. If anyone can pull such a trick, I'd be very curious to know. So this is why, no matter short-term or long-term, when investors exit in the trade, the exit value always should reflect the infinite long-term discount. Now, after we talk about the market, is managerial short-termism in the long-termist market possible? And the answer is yes. And there are theory models that would deliver this with two elements. One is asymmetric information, and the other is frequent monitoring. Most businesses are prone to some kind of stakeholder run. If one day your stakeholders, your creditors, suppliers, employees decided that the firm is in trouble and they deserve the firm, and the firm will flounder. For this reason, managers find it's very important to take actions or overinvest in creating signals that will create a favorable impression about the fundamental health of the firm. But the market is not formed by this. This is why the market will throw a tantrum when a firm misses a penny in its earnings forecast. Because the market understands that the shortfall is there despite the management of the best effort to pull resources from all sides to make up the shortfall. The resulting policy implications become quite nuanced. It seems on the one hand you want more disclosure, on the other hand you don't want much disclosure. On the one hand you don't want to watch the management at every minute, on the other hand you also do not want to shelter them from frequent monitoring. Where would be the best balance? So I think in the end the debate is not about what to do, but about who gets to decide. Take staggered boards versus declassified boards. Institutional investors low staggered boards these days. Now, in the declassified boards, all board members are in theory up for re-election annually. It's not like institutional investors want to replace the boards every year, but they want to retain the right to hold board members accountable so that 
they have the right to replace them if they're not accountable. Think about dividends versus retained earnings. Dividend paid will still roll back to the ecosystem of the production. Now, if it's retained earnings, the management gets to decide what to do with the money and when to invest, what to invest. When the dividends are paid out, the management has to convince with the market in the new equity or debt issuance that they have a project that is positive MPV. In the past, investors have been, have been quite willing to make concessions to visionary dictators, such as Steve Jobs. Knowing that these people are successful, precisely they always defy convention and resist authority. But less so now. As in the case of failed attempt of Mark Zuckerberg try to reclassify Facebook, as well as investors' outrage to the triggering by Elon Musk. Maybe gradually we will see that the public and private capital markets will evolve to cater different stages as well as different circumstances. In the past, we think about the private market is an incubator for young and fledgling firms. But today, they are also the place for formerly iconic, mature public companies. Dell is one, so is Heinz, Mars, Hilton, where we're living, where we stay right now, etc. ID and innovation, those who are done by the public powerhouses like Microsoft and Merck, are very different from the ID conducted by one product, small companies, waiting to be acquired. The jury is still out whether short-termism is a real problem or it's imaginary. This is always good news for academics because it will ask for more research and more debate. Thank you very much. She brought up the difference between public and private companies. Many people have observed that the number of publicly listed companies in the United States has declined over the last decade or so, and so the, the issue is, what is your take on why that occurs, and does it say anything about public versus private markets and the topic of the day? So I actually think it's a very, very promising topic area um, to analyze why the public market has been shrinking. And in fact, the development of the private market is actually blurring the difference line between public and private. So for example, right now, the mutual funds are actually holding unicorn positions. And there's a huge uh, proposal out there um, promoting private investments to pension funds because they are there for the long term. Now, if we see this trend to, to grow, if the pension funds start to invest in private companies, then there will be regulatory pressure for more disclosure, more transparency for those investments. And then the pension funds or the mutual funds will also have to compromise on the liquidity. So if T. Rowe Price and those fund families hold more and more unicorns and beyond a certain percentage, it will be very, very difficult for them to maintain the daily liquidity that people have been taking for granted. So in the end, I think they will, the private market will actually become more like public market because there will be some trading in the secondary marketplace with some limited liquidity, and investors will demand more and more transparency, more disclosure. So that makes them not so much private. But I still think it's a, it's, it's a very, very promising topic that requires more research as where the public market shrinkage is going. So uh, you, you talked about how these large private investors, they're long term, and they have uh, almost 30 percent ownership in corporate America. Um, but then there are public companies that uh, that are concentrating their voting rights. Right? Snapchat being the most yes. recent example. Mm -hmm. Is that an issue to be concerned about? Well, on the one hand, you have exchanges saying, well, investors know, it's disclosed, mm -hmm. you decide what you want to do as an investor. Mm -hmm. And then there are uh, the FTSEs and the S&Ps of the world, and, uh, and BlackRock says, well, those guys should get into this business of uh, deciding who should be in an index and who should not be. 
The reason is that if there's a correlation, like larger funds tend to support one side, then there will be no equilibrium, there will be no context, because one side will obviously win. Okay? So when we look at, say, the proxy context, okay, all the large proxy context, the dissidents won 49.4% of the time, which means half of the time. So the reason is that when something that's very, very contentious happens, it's almost a very, very pivotal stage. Like funds like Fidelity, funds like BlackRock, like BlackRock support dissidents 41% of the time. Fidelity support dissidents over 50% of the time. So there's this force that saw them out on both sides because when both sides feel so strongly to stick their gun to the last fight, they must both have pretty strong merit case. So the top five, despite being so concentrated, they are not predicting one side to win when a true context happens, whether they're passive or active. Okay, Ravi. You have been focusing on the active market, and I'm wondering if there could be any general implication to the other market, like the bond markets, modern market. So first I have to apologize. I'm, I'm really have very, very limited about uh, the bond market. So the reason that we focus on equity market is that uh, when a firm is not in distress, it seems the, the shareholders uh, uh, vote on proposals or on elections, so that's why we'll be focusing on, on, on the shareholders. Yeah, right. You made a very interesting observation that a few large funds, uh, fund management companies, yeah. are holding a large fraction of the AUM. And they are active in exercising the proxy on the yes. of the people who hold. Yes. But here's the question. I invest in, let's say I hold an ETF, yeah. that's the S&P 500 ETF. Yeah. And that's with BlackRock. Mm -hmm. BlackRock has to exercise, has to watch the right thing for individual companies or yeah. So what's the incentive for BlackRock to do the right thing within, I mean, within courts, whether it even knows what the right thing is? And who's monitoring them? And it looks like there's a huge disconnect. So these days, I think the larger funds to cast an informed vote in the best interests of investors. Now, in theory, it is part of the fiduciary duty. Now, in reality, obviously, as you point out, what is the incentive, right? So I think the incentive is partly is the publicity. I think these days, when the Dupont case happened, or PNG, we actually know who voted for what. So if a fund is constantly caught voting in the seeming right, wrong direction, I think it's a huge reputation damage on the firm. So I think the fact that the, the, the outcome of the votes are public already put a lot of uh, pressure on these funds. And from what I read about the BlackRock, or, or talking to people from Vanguard, I'm actually quite impressed by how diligent they work on, on the voting voting issues. Oh, yes, sir. So, uh, do you think uh, proxy advisors uh, help or hurt corporate governance? That's that's very interesting. Interesting question because I, I I try to look into this and I don't have a clear answer. I think that requires more research to establish whether they are good or bad. So currently, uh, we find out about 10% um, of the assets, they vote 100% with what the ISSF. So the Institutional Shareholder Services, they vote for this, they will vote for this. If you run a simple regression, the sway margin is around 25 to 35%. So if you just run, but the active, the, the actual sway margin, I believe, probably somewhere between 15 and 20%. So that means the, Voting proxy advisors, they actually capture about 20% of the actual voting power. And I personally feel that's something very dangerous. <coughs> but we don't know whether they did the right, right thing or wrong thing. But just from a priori, for a third party uh, proxy advisor to advise on important things that will actually persuade for 20 percentage of the votes, I, I don't like that fact. But have they do the down the right thing or wrong thing, I don't have a conclusion. Thank you very much.